our guests for the hour are seated it's a full house this hour and we're looking at a very important topic and i said i this morning i said to myself this is something that's very dear to me when i think about it and i say uh, there should be no wastage especially when we are looking at um those who do not have um the international day of awareness on food loss and waste is a conversation that we're having this hour and our guests are in the studio already seated um by way of introduction professor jane ambuko is a professor is a professor of horticulture at the university of nairobi uh, Kenya. Uh, Winnie Yegon is the food systems analyst for the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, that's FAO. And Dr. Christopher Mutungi is a senior researcher at Food Program World Resources Institute. They are here this morning. And as we get into it, we're going to welcome you all with today's problem before we hear your voices. How easy it is to defeat people who don't kindle the fire for themselves. That's the proverb for the day. What we said at the beginning of the week is that we will not state where the proverbs are from in terms of which part of the country. But we ask our listeners and those like you wonderful people who are in the show to try and determine whether the communities you come from have similar proverbs. If they don't, well, maybe they'll have a proverb, proverb similar to the one that we will hear tomorrow. Hmm. Hmm. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. Dr. Christopher Mutungi, good morning. Good morning, Edu. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Jane Ambuko, good morning to you. Good morning. Winnie, good morning. Good morning. Karibuni sana uh, to this conversation. Let's repeat that again. I'd like to hear from each of you what you think about this proverb. Okay. How easy it is to defeat people who don't kindle the fire for themselves. Prof, we start with you. <laughs> okay, to defeat people who don't kindle the fire for themselves yes to defeat okay it's easy to defeat people who don't kindle the fire for themselves okay so what do you want to say it is how it resonates with you this is one of those situations where you can't be wrong <laughs> <laughs> even yeah. if you try okay because it is your own opinion right yes yeah so if they can't kindle the fire for themselves it yes. basically means somebody has to do it for them mm -hmm. right mm. so they are basically at the masses of the one who kindles the fire See? something like that <laughs> it's painless <laughs> mm. what about you winnie um i think first they don't even realize there's a fire <laughs> so they're probably burning if you can't kindle your own fire are you <laughs> there's probably something wrong if you can't realize you're burning that you need to wait for someone else to come and <laughs> stop the fire okay so there's people protecting their fire there are those who don't realize they're burning <laughs> dr mutungi what do you think about this proverb i i i think um the proverbs speaks to the fact that people should always have a solution for themselves. Mm. I mean, you cannot just sit and expect other people to do everything for you. And therefore, um, yeah, it requires that people have um, a way of sorting their own issues. Mm. That's the way I see it. Voila, Santa Claus. You know, on a scale of one to ten, we like to give an assessment, though this isn't an exam. <laughs> 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 so on a scale of ten, 1 to 10 yeah. all of you have scored 11 yeah. and the reason is because you've given us your opinion and then you've added just a little bit more in explaining it but everything you've said some of some of what you've said resonates with what we have spoken of here and some of it we're hearing for the first time so mm. it's good hmm. mm. okay well I guess it's a good day because everybody gets over overachievers <laughs> <laughs> already and this is where we are so we're looking at a day today um or rather we're looking at a day will tell us exactly when that day is uh but um uh, and looking at food loss and waste so when we talk about food loss and waste the importance of it or the importance of addressing it um winnie maybe we can start off with you some you know very clear definitions here when we talk about food loss and f and waste what exactly are we saying does that mean that i have a plate and i don't eat it all and i throw it in the dustbin or what are we talking about when we talk about food loss 
So thank you for your question. So when you talk about food loss and waste, we are referring to food that was intended for human consumption that ultimately isn't consumed. So the difference between food loss and waste is where it occurs in what we call the value chain. So we are looking at all the actions from the farm right up to disposal of the food. So from the farm to where we have uh, the retailers, we call that food loss. And then from retail to the consumer level, that is what we call food waste. So when you talk of food loss and waste, uh, when, we, when we are discussing issues, around food and nutrition security we are always thinking of producing the food how do we get to increase our production and our productivity however now when we flip the tables we are looking at what do we do with the food that we have produced mm. and that is where the conversation around food loss and waste comes in because we are talking about 30 to 40 percent for kenya food loss and waste and this is food that you know we have spent resources we have put in money we have put in time we have put in investments to ensure that we are producing the food but food loss and waste it directly takes out from what we are producing and it, 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 it doesn't have any benefit to anyone because, you know, when we are losing the food, uh, we have different ways of how we want to address it. But if we are just to take food loss and waste as it is, then it's food that is just going, you know, nowhere. It's, it's, going, uh, it's detrimental to the environment because it's food that uh, is not being consumed. 30 to 40 percent of the food that Kenya produces goes to waste and loss. Dr. Mutungi? Yeah, those are the statistics um, for now. Um, and, and, and one has to see this loss um, from different angles, really. I mean, if you're losing 30% and um, agriculture contributes 33% of our GDP, then that means you are actually almost uh, getting over with 10% uh, of your GDP. So it's really massive. Um, huge. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. And if we're looking at that loss vis-a-vis -vis the number of people who are going hungry. Okay, let's look at the last 10 years where we had the most severe droughts in Kenya, as an example, uh, where people were going hungry and there was rations and there was food aid that was being given out. But we're saying that uh, food is going to waste. We're losing it. So help me to understand, uh, Professor when we say that food has been lost, I mean, obviously we've gotten that um, definition from Winnie, but we are saying that it's been produced, it should be for consumption. Where are the breaks here that then doesn't allow this food to get from where it has been produced to the people who obviously need it? And then we still are saying that there's a situation whereby the state is depressed because people cannot eat. Right. So thank you, uh, Andrew, for your question. Yeah. So like uh, Winnie and uh, Chris have already said, you see, we produce food mm. enough. Uh, and uh, you, you can bear me witness that actually our farmers work so hard to produce food. But uh, the leaks are everywhere. You know, that 30% or 40% statistic cuts across. Some food is lost at the farm. Some is lost during transport. Some all the way. So at every stage of the supply chain there's some concession some uh, some loss happens eh? and so like chris said uh, uh, these losses you know they translate into we just i think we look at it as just food has gone to waste but it's all the efforts the resources that have gone into producing that food picture a farmer who's produced let's say let's me i'm a hot culturist so i'll talk about horticulture mm. i don't know if you've seen sometimes on tv they show uh, images of tomatoes being fed to cows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you look at that and you, you feel pain because that, you know, producing tomato is one of the most expensive ventures because the seed has to be quality seed, you know, the, the, you know, all the agro inputs that goes into production. So when the farmer produces and for one reason or another, it doesn't make it to the market, yes, it has many factors. Eh? It's either there is no market mm. or there is, uh, you know, this overproduction because of uh, everybody producing tomatoes. So that is left there at the farm. So that already is wasted. And that wasted, you look at it as the effort of the farmer who has used resources that are already limited to produce, uh, you know, tomatoes that will never make it to the market. And so he's counting the losses of the time, mm. the inputs, and everything that goes to it. And then for me, the consumer, for example, I come. And because of these uh, losses, I don't know how much you pay for 
tomato at the uh, in Nairobi. Hmm. I do not know how much. You, okay, your fi- wife knows. Do you do you know how much you pay for a tomato per kilo? Well, right now you're paying about 80, 90 shillings. Okay. Per kilo. Do you know how much the farmer is paid for? I I don't. Per kilo. It's usually a fraction. It's usually a fraction because everybody factors in you know these losses as it moves from the farm all the way to the consumer some losses happen and so when the trader for example uh let let me see okay now mango let mango my favorite fruit mm. at the farm level the mango will probably retail for five shillings mm-hmm. at the farm level the same mango will probably retail for upwards of 60 shillings in nairobi yeah so when the trader pays the farmer three shillings or five shillings they factored in this leaks uh, yeah so somebody has to pay you the consumer you're paying dearly for a mango that you shouldn't pay so much for because of these inefficiencies and losses and the farmer is not getting value you know they should get a little bit more but the trader knows that some wastage is going to happen in transit so they can't pay so much mm. yes so it is when you look at it it's it is a is <laughs> a problem of like when you say this it's, it's economic because of the monetary losses it is uh, it is uh, is an environmental problem because those mangoes like she said eventually end up in some landfill yeah yes and all that so that is what he is talking about when you talk about the wastage it cuts across there's no specific place where it happens and like when you said in your own kitchen mm. yes you leave some food on the table yes on your plate mm. and goes to your kitchen that's been mm. that is part of it so collectively that's what we're saying what can we do to reduce these losses and wastage at each point mm. Mm. you know yes. the thing that comes to mind even as i'm hearing you speak we we are focusing on perishable goods now if we know they're perishable surely in this modern day and age of technology is can we not mitigate i mean is it that complicated many people have fridges in their house that little gadget mitigates against the very thing that we're talking about here. Because food is left over. If there's a fridge, that food can be eaten again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's why people talk of eating leftovers. Thank you. So that's mitigating against waste. Because it's not thrown away. It's actually eaten at a later time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, my mind went to, say, fisher folk. And I'm thinking, their product is really very perishable. No, so again, without... This, this value add that is necessary to ensure that the wastage that you speak of right at the point where you are producing this particular food, it's not something that is unattainable. So why is it not attained if it's not unattainable? I mean... Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. So like you said, perishable produce is actually where we have a lot of wastage. Eh? You talked about the fish. Fish is uh, once it gets out of the water yeah, that's it that's Done. it yeah so there's a lot of wastage there and obviously you've had a lot of initiatives to have cold storage right at the point of uh, you know at of fishing yes but for fruits and vegetables again very perishable you know if we don't have cold storage yeah you know the wastage at the farm is enormous so obviously like you say there are a lot of interventions uh, you know on farm storage yes. and uh, also value addition you know like transforming them into mm. shelf stable products sources yes. Sauce, Ace, thank, thank you like yes this. or grind yes. them or right. grind them yes. you, yeah you you i think you, you remember the 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 governor of makweni mm. yes and uh, because wastage in mango has always been a big deal for mm. mango producing regions what did he do turned it into juice yes they, so they have this big factory transforming the perishable mangoes into pulp mm. which they're actually exporting and also right now mango is off season so they are selling to those who make juice so that is one way but you see that can be done in all other produce we just need to you know make this that's why i saying that's why we're here mm. to make the case for this thing because we can do something what? and mm. the truth is we know what to do we oh. just need to do that's what when you saw the the governor mcquenny put up that factory i think he knew that you know um this is what needs to be done so yeah farmers now can take their mangoes there they're processed into you know this pulp which or dried 
which is available, you know, throughout the year while mm -hmm. the mangoes are off season. So there are interventions, as my colleagues will say, there are a lot of interventions that can be done to to minimize uh, that kind of loss but at the farm level. So can you tell us some of those interventions? And I think that's where we ought to be going now yeah. in this conversation. Yeah. I think of a time gone by and uh, where people who live by the water would fish the same fish that we're talking about but it would not go to waste because they would dry it and yeah. they would use it for months mm. they would smoke the fish they would dry the fish yep. sun dry the fish hang it up in their homes they would do the same thing with meat mm -hmm. they would preserve vegetables in milk for days and it would become sour is it possible to do these things on a grander scale? And I think that's what we're looking at because I'm still stuck on that 30 to 40 percent. That's a ridiculously high number yes. in terms of food that's being lost. So what are some of these interventions that can actually happen, Dr. Terry? Yeah, thank you, um, Do for this question. Um, <clears throat> let me put it this way. There are technologies out there, but as you say, um, we are in an era that we are also facing um, our own challenges. And, and therefore, some of these traditionist practices somehow we have to look uh, for a way of scaling them or making them really move to the industrial space. And this is what we do at, at WRI. We work with small um, enterprises, small and medium enterprises, and we want them to upgrade the technologies mm -hmm. so that whatever, in principle, I mean, is the same thing, but they apply, um, you know, technologies that then will enable them to produce products that they can take to the market, get, you know, the produce out there in, uh, in, in large scale and, and, and get, uh, you know, incomes out of it. You see, um, we have, as if we have to address food loss and waste, we really have to also connect with even national development goals. Mm. I mean, today we speak of unemployment. SMEs are a pathway that would create jobs for many, many, many youths. And, and if you apply or you scale up or you twist a little bit some of those traditional technologies, then they become an avenue for even um, greater spin-offs in the economy. Mm. Mm. Winnie, for you. Yes, um, uh, there's something I picked up uh, from the discussion, and this is the social issues that we also need to address. Because sometimes I feel as technical experts, we, f we focus a lot on the technical component. So we have mm -hmm. the technologies, we have the research, we have all the solutions. But what about the social cultural influences? Like I like what he mentioned about uh, having the refrigerator and uh, eating leftovers. But uh, how many African men eat leftovers? Because I have interacted with a few who say they want fresh food every day. They want a new meal every day. So, you know, these are some of the things, and that is why we are having this International Day of Awareness mm. to really raise the awareness. And then you talk about things like drying. How many people know how to use dry tomatoes? How many people want to consume dry vegetables? Mm. So we also need to think about the consumer of all these things you are trying to promote at the production end. Because this these technologies are there, and if I can also introduce the whole idea of systems, because I'm a food systems analyst, mm. I can't not introduce systems thinking and that is what we are promoting in FAO. We are trying to link all these different uh, nodes. Because when you talk of uh, cold storage facilities and you talk of all these technologies, we can't really support them. And the reason some of them are not working so well is because of the energy. You know, we need energy. We need clean energy because all these processing plants, all these cold storage facilities, they need energy. Whether it is solar energy or electricity energy. So when you look at the cost of investing in the processing then we need to bring in different stakeholders not just people who are involved in the agriculture sector we need to bring in all these other you know sectors to support us to really ensure the success really? i am waiting for that question yeah what? you know he's not he's not gonna <laughs> let it go so let's you know let's you know get it out now <laughs> i mean one is spoiled for choice mm. whether it is ngos whether it is whoever it is who keep talking about how it is green energy is a plenty in this country mm. and how we are number one on the continent and probably number one on the planet. Mm. You look around you, there's solar technology for desalination of water. Why? We have more sun than you know what to do with. Mm. Mm. And there are people who do these things. Now, when you talk linkage, you're talking a good language, which means you want to connect these available resources to this. Mm. I don't think it is the availability of the resources 
or the linkage that is a problem is the willingness mm. because there are people who benefit from the status quo yes true all these things that we're discussing and there are people who somehow benefit immensely from it so if you change that ecosystem that benefit will either diminish or disappear altogether mm. so they will not allow it mm. you yes and uh, when we when we talk of systems thinking there there's one critical pillar that we call uh, changing the incentive so you know when you're changing a system that is working even with the with the negative uh, effects of that system like you're saying there are people that are benefiting from it Eventually. but yes. we need to identify the different incentives for the same people because you can't do away with them hmm. we still need to find a way to uh, improve the sustainability of the agri-food system while ensuring you know we are we are managing the trade-offs which is not a very easy thing to do it's a complex it's a complex thing to do. And one of the things we are doing as FA is supporting development of a strategy. And we hope that the strategy, you know, yes. How, how is it difficult to get rid of middlemen? <laughs> because if you look yes. at many of the problems that we have, they are mm. caused by middlemen. Middlemen, Middle mm. you can also call them cartels. Yeah, cartels. yeah they, they actually don't do anything <laughs> except be in the middle. Mm. And, and they, the they the give you the impression they're important and they have to facilitate mm. and they have to. Mm. Let me give an agricultural example. Mm. In a time gone by, in the previous century, when I myself personally was youthful, <laughs> if you, as I was, you're your, not I was, that hard. <laughs> <laughs> All the time. Look at me very carefully, <laughs> carefully, okay, and tell me if you see youth anywhere. Anyway, that, 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 <laughs> the point is, it might take a while. Yeah. But no. <laughs> Let's say, they, if you entered immigration and wanted a passport. There were throngs of people who did nothing useful except give you the impression they want to help you. Yep. This is a government office. Mm -hmm. And somehow the process of getting a passport was almost impossible we if don't. you did not engage these people. Yep. Mm -hmm. They no longer exist. True that. They don't exist. Mm -hmm. You simply walk to the counter, you ask what it is that you want. Same with the ID. They were always there. How are they gotten rid of? Mm -hmm. I'm simply saying that. A great deal of the problems that we have are not systems. Systems work, but the problem with people, people are the ones who operationalize systems. Okay? Mm -hmm. The status quo is easy to deal with because change often involves tipping the apple cart and moving things in directions you may not particularly want to. And then also there's the question of resistance. Mm -hmm. Because this conversation, year in, year out, it's even strange. You have a situation where you have a part of the country that doesn't have food. Mm -hmm. And there's one where... Where, where cabbages right. are rotting mm. in the farms. Yeah, so, so you wonder, and it's the same country. Yes. Yep. Yes. Farmers are pouring out milk. Yep. There's a part of the country where people have no idea what they're going to eat the next day. True. You wonder. That day. Surely, mm. is, is there a problem here? Mm. And of course there's a problem. Mm. And then organizations like yours have to come in to give people who don't have the food, food, yet there is food in another part of the country. Now. But, but isn't this the thing, and, I, and we're going to go to a break in a minute, but isn't that the thing, that then these linkages need to be set up so that these systems, where we're saying things that are being done at a micro level need to be graduated to the mm. point where there is an understanding across board that you have this thing in plenty. Can you dehydrate your milk? and mm -hmm. turn it into powder mm -hmm. can you dry your vegetables and use them for storage later that you can now supply them on a national scale where there is no food in the future can you dry your meat on a higher level we're looking at these issues and we're saying okay it was important to say are there systems in place where these things can be recognized and shouldn't we be looking at graduated levels of these things that are done at a micro level uh, i guess we'll start with you dr Terry, or professor yeah so yeah like winnie has already said uh, and chris also alluded to it we have tried interventions on small scale but uh there's need to scale this up yeah but even before we scale um we said that you just mentioned do mm. in the past people used to do things mm. people used to drive vegetables fruits and we sort of lost that so even before we scale i still think at household level the things that we can do yes that we can do actually mm -hmm. like now we're talking about el nino is coming and there's gonna be a lot of vegetables yes and you know people if you have a kitchen garden mm -hmm. you're going to have a square there's going to be plenty because leafy vegetables like this all they need is water so there's going to be that so 
what can be done first mm. of all even before we scale it uh, for commercial eh? what can be done how can we you know train or help households to actually just preserve food for their own consumption because they're talking about first of all household food and nutrition security mm. okay because we we're dealing with very small parcels of land and also even in urban areas you're talking about kitchen gardens so at that point there's something you can do yeah to actually preserve if you're having vegetables can you dry them like winnie said uh, and but there's a challenge again we kenyans i think because we are spoiled for choice we have a lot of options you can find vegetables and fruits anytime we haven't even appreciated the value of drying food to use later so can we start there and let people know that in fact this dry tomato or this dried mango is as nutritious as the fresh one it's just that this is how you're going to use it. this is how to dry it and how to use it later after drying and then of course uh, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, chris said you see cottage industries would be born out of this uh, small uh, processes to reduce losses i can tell you for a, for example um we as appreciating the importance of on farm storage and small scale processing we established small scale aggregation and processing center for farmers as university of nairobi yeah so we train them how to add value to fruits mm -hmm. and vegetables and sell but you know what the challenge was mm. kenyans don't eat dried produce mm. so if the, the challenge is we can actually do that they can dry the fruits they can dry the vegetables for example but if there are no off takers yes if there's no local market you see it's just i call it expensive waste because you have spent time and resources to make a product that nobody's going to buy are we looking at the why are we looking at the why Kenyans don't eat dry food and dry vegetables or anybody else for that matter. We need talked about a sensitization yes. that needs to happen to mm -hmm. make people understand that this is just the same food in another form and that you can reconstitute it totally. and it comes back to right. what you're yes. used to. Yes. Uh, so what is the reason why? Is there a feeling of, you know, it's not it's the same Yeah, the Also the taste and preferences. So that is why even as FAO we are really uh, trying to develop recipes for how to use your dry vegetables, your dry fruits. Because some of these things, um, to be honest, unless you know how to cook it, you might do something crazy in your kitchen. So there's, there's a way to reconstitute uh, dry vegetables. And I'm sure, like you mentioned, even the dry fish. You can't cook dry fish the same way you cook fresh fish. So maybe those the community around... Uh, that used to practice the drying of fish might know how to use the fish but now we are we are we are now a global village we are now you know expanding we are living everywhere so we need to also share these recipes in addition to sensitization and raising awareness on this uh, issue yes yes <laughs> <laughs> yes there is raising awareness but <laughs> there's uh, the efforts that you're making have you as you work with these communities because the, the responses to the questions we are raising, the people with whom we are working and whom we are trying to influence, okay. usually know the answer. They only require to be asked. For instance, what do I mean? You're talking collaboration. Now, you're talking links. Yes, it starts with those communities. Now, in each of these communities, you will find there are still individuals who know and understand how they preserved foods. Mm -hmm. Now, how closely do we? Knowledge. Yes, how do we work with these people? You look at the health sector, there's this term we call them midwives, okay? In the health sector, they're called traditional birth attendants. Mm. Over time, the health sector have realized that for you to work in communities, you need to work with these people. Yeah. And you need to also introduce them to modern ways of doing things. The reason is not because of the skill. They have skill, but they have something that you don't have. They're trusted. Yep. They have influence. Huge, mm. huge influence yeah. mm -hmm. now in the same way there are people in all these communities that you work in who people trust now if you gather the knowledge and these are the people who actually champion these things that you're talking about in terms of whether you can accept these new forms of food mm. essentially you are trying to implement it's a behavior change intervention mm -hmm. and for it to actually uh get the currency of acceptance that is required the people 
in those very communities have to accept it and they'll accept it easier from people they know and already trust than from you even if the idea is extremely wonderful now everything that we're discussing here again if you talk to people the tradition who understand these traditional methods and they're still there they will walk you through very many interesting things that would provide the solution but one has to work with them and they're the people who would probably be your champions because people who have that sort of knowledge can easily see how whatever it is you are talking about and introducing can work with what they already have the problem is if they are left out they will be your greatest headache mm. because they are the very people who people will go to ask and they will tell them that thing doesn't work they, in fact that 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 thing will kill you and you know that's the end of that story <laughs> that's that's true and i think that is something that is coming out a lot i i don't know whether it is new but that is something that's coming out a lot the social cultural aspects of this uh, bottleneck that we are trying to solve because i feel like the, the uh, an important person we have left out at the social scientist you know she's from horticulture he's an expert on food loss i'm an expert i come from agriculture economics I'm a social scientist that is you see you 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 now you get the gist <laughs> but, but that is the reason why i'm saying what i'm saying yes mm-hmm. yeah because so we need to back to my linkages yes. and collaboration bring yeah. in the social scientists because a lot of these things will indeed involve behavior change mm-hmm. first yes. to accept the solutions we are trying to to propose because like you say the system is working first understanding it mm. and understanding it from their point of view not yours yes yes is mm. the system working though because it, if the system was actually working mm. whereby across board there are many things that have happened that at the very base level there is an understanding that we can actually change our behavior and how we deal with food and then graduated from there we can actually make sure that there's lobbying and there's persistence mm. on mm. making sure that some of these things are actually enacted and then beyond that there's a systemic change across board so much more that government policy comes into place to make sure some of these things are actually done this refrigeration matter that we're talking about for fish for example is something that has been discussed but it's been discussed mm. very f- little in terms of implementation has happened mm-hmm. so if yeah. there's the understanding at the base level and then there's implementation there's policy and it's graduated to the top this 30 to 40% that i clearly have an issue with then we'll start to reduce is it not sure. yeah yeah I, i mean um do i think i like your idea and and city you mentioned the idea of uh, working with champions mm. and i b- totally believe that we got to make use of uh, you know local knowledge mm. in the development of our solutions but having said that um then we really have also to uh, to 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 get to understand that we are actually now a global village and and this idea of um seeing a solution coming um from the local perspective is perhaps good but it must uh, spread beyond i mean you cannot grow if you are processing just to sell to your fellow villagers we must see uh, markets beyond our village uh, boundaries um you you raised and uh, do you raise the question or you raised the issue mm-hmm. of you know did, did we have for example the last four years um lack of food in the northeastern part of, of the country when we really had also plenty in some counties mm-hmm. if we had a system of processing and storing this food would it, we have moved that food to the northern eastern part wouldn't there have been a market for even what you think is not really consumed mm-hmm. and, and 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 so this is we we really have to have a disruptive way of doing things and and um, i agree totally with you that also um, we have to engage in policy discussions we have to begin to ask ourselves what really needs to change and and i think from the academia some of these things um are on paper I, i think they are on our fingertips so what we need to do perhaps is also to to accelerate the rate at which we engage with policy makers i want to ask you a question doctor are we really a global village <laughs> well it, it depends um <laughs> but i i see it happening for example with with other spheres uh, like in technology don't you see that mm. city i do why would it not happen with food the reason i'm asking if we are a, gl- a global village yeah? to internationalize something it means that the people to whom you are preaching this gospel already know the gospel and understanding at their level that is why the emphasis on getting people at that very local level to get this thing going see 
it's very difficult to internationalize a concept when somebody is hungry mm. is broke they produce something and they're staring at it all their neighbors produce it so you can't sell it to anyone mm. all these things that make for what you call a global village cannot possibly work if at the local level people are unable to just get the basics in place for themselves mm. they they have to start there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there has to be that assurance if you look at again traditional communities why do you think the concept of barter existed because it was understood mm -hmm. these people produce this these people have this so this market places that people met in it was to barter i have mm -hmm. this you have this mm -hmm. i have geese you have ducks i have goats you have sheep that that sort of yeah. thing mm -hmm. so it was understood now if we remove that concept because in in modern day life we we stop using butter we had a common rate of exchange in a common medium for exchange mm. but that concept didn't go anywhere it just morphed into something we call new now now the traditional societies we call them traditional because they one tend to be in the rural areas but they still hold on to some of the norms that we consider to be our cultural heritage mm. now you can't discount it mm. the global village that you refer to exists and is made vibrant because of diversity Mm. and this concept and this idea and the reality of the traditional community is part of this concept mm. can so, we look at food loss or food waste outside the context of people in the country going hungry uh, because look it, it, it and it might sound strange but food loss food waste 30 40 percent wouldn't matter okay hold on wouldn't matter if you did not have people within the same country who were hungry mm. but why it is so alarming and why we're saying something needs to be done about it is that there's food loss and there's food waste that's happening and you have a significant number of people at any given time who are hungry and so that is why it matters and are we saying that there's a direct correlation between this food that's going to waste and these people that are hungry and can we make up for that loss and have these people fed? Because if we cannot, then we might as well be talking about, I don't know, camels walking on the beach. It has to be, there has to be a link mm. between the two. And can we make those linkages that if we see a reduction of this food loss or food waste, bring that 30% down to 15. If we see that, can we then now see that the 22 million people who are at risk of going hungry just six, seven, eight months ago, that number reduces to 10 million because now they're being fed on a regular from this loss? Is there a direct link between the two? Mm. And if there isn't, then again, psh, yeah. what are we doing? Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying, you know, those, those are very important statistics. Huh? Mm. But, um, and actually it's, it's been published or it's been um uh, said that the food that we waste globally mm. could actually feed up to 2 billion people. Yes? Mm. So there are these data there, and uh, I think that brings me to the fact that one of the things that we, because can you imagine if what you just said do, if mm. we can just present that to the, the CS of agriculture and say, do you know if we just reduced the food loss and waste, then we could plug the deficit in our food balance sheet. We don't need, you know, how much food we import to plug the deficit. So, you see, we, we need that evidence for mm. us to actually then move, you know, the policymakers to action. Mm. Yeah? Because that food that goes to waste can feed people, like you say, mm -hmm. feed people who are starving. I mean, it has to pain us. When you actually, in your house, you're throwing some food and you see those images of people who are, you know, you've seen before, you know, people, those people, pictures should haunt us, you know. But knowing, like you said, that while that is happening, actually somebody, a farmer is feeding his cabbages on, I mean using his cabbages mm. produced with limited resources to feed the cows because they can't get them to the market or because the market is flooded or the milk is being poured. You know, those things is, is, is a paradox. Like in the same country, people are wasting food. Uh, I mean, are throwing away food and others are actually, you know, boiling. It's, uh, those images haunt us, yeah? So we need to also make a case. I mean, like to show this evidence, not just for the food. Chris already mentioned the fact that uh, 
when this food also goes to the where it goes to the dustbin yeah it creates another problem mm -hmm. yeah i mean we are now talking you had uh, the big discussion on climate change everybody's talking about climate change and you know we need to plant trees and when do you know food loss and waste also contributes to greenhouse gases yes mm. yes 10% Uh, Chris can correct me. Ten percent of the greenhouse gases are from food loss and waste. So, but we need to show that evidence. So, as government is assigning this, I understand there's a lot of money for climate action. Mm. How do we get a piece mm. of that to show that you know? Prof, does that money exist? I don't know, but I understand this. I mean, I've heard figures thrown around and sure. they're huge. Me too. And everybody is uh, yes. taking, uh, and taking and their... Length, length length. I'd like to see someone who has received that money. <laughs> because then we can talk to them about it and then we can find out. Because those figures are huge. True. Okay? Yeah. There is an, even a whole carbon economy where yes. you can trade and... Uh, okay, I've even read how it works. <laughs> And you can increase and reduce credit. Yes, I am like yet yes. to meet someone who will tell me, "This is I have received it, and, and this is how it works." I'm not saying it doesn't. I guess it is I who has not mm. seen, mm. Uh, but I've read about mm. it. Yeah. Let me ask this question, even as you, even as you're saying what you're saying, there, there's something Chris mentioned, which gets to the heart of the matter. If he talked about a global village, the journey to being part of that global village. Fundamentals that human beings need food, shelter, and water. water. That's just about it. Is Love. it possible for us with the things we're discussing to get this into our curriculum so that it's something that is taught? Mm -hmm. So as you grow up, it's part of what you do. Exactly. Like this habit we have of you eat something, you throw it out of the window. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh -huh. Okay? Yeah. It's a habit. Yep. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. And when, as you correctly put it, you go for a function and there's a buffet, mm -hmm. and you find someone at the mountain, and you're thinking, <laughs> is this guy going to finish his food, really? <laughs> Behavior change. Yes, mm -hmm. or have they not yes. been informed that you know something, just eat a bit and you can go back. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay? yeah. Whatever the case is, how, whatever the explanation, mm. some of these things can be inculcated in people at a young age. Mm. So as they grow up, they, they know, it's something they know and understand. Yeah. If you go to a country called Israel and look at the way they manage water, mm -hmm. They know they're in a desert. They are. A des they know. Mm. But you, you don't waste water True. in that place. True. So even when you're a visitor, it it will. It's a in a day you'll have understood. Mm. But this thing of leaving the tap running as we do here, you cannot do there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. What they're taught. It's mm. true. I yeah. think you're really bringing something important to the discussion, which is understanding the people, mm. because all these things we are talking about. They are people led. They are not being, we are not wasting, machines are not wasting the food. No, mm -hmm. It is the people. And unless we really understand that bottleneck of how we translate all this, all these things we are saying into action, right. which is transforming people's mindsets. Mm. And if I could go back, allow me to systems, yes. you mm -hmm. know, we keep targeting agriculture. I like what Prof said, you know, build a case for the CS of agriculture. But when you're talking about behavior change, you also need the CS of education. Because all these curriculums need to be in education. We also need the CS of social services. Because all this food distribution is done there. We need the CS of energy. Mm -hmm. To, you know, to, to within their plans, allocate some money to, to channel the energy into all these agro-processing facilities mm -hmm. we are doing. We need the CS of health. Because nutrition is a very key component. You know, all these things we are complaining because also had these food waste and this food waste yeah so are we are we wasting food internally <laughs> in the waste <laughs> yes so you know this this conversation is very complex and if we if we if we tailor the message in the right way and ensure everyone is playing their role because i mean we can't just keep talking and talking without bringing the people that we need to be talking to okay. in the conversation mm -hmm. so that issue of behavior change is something that you have really brought out very well and it's something that we have also included in the strategy we are developing mm. how to really bring in social services and the children because i think in swahili going back to the proverbs i hope we all understand swahili umkunje samaki angali mbichi you fold a fish when, when the it fish is, is fresh. fresh yes because when you try and fold a fish one it's once it's it's once once it's dry it cracks it so where done. are the children in this conversation we need to go to the children because these things are 
you know it's a habit you pick up when you're young and when you're older if we mm. tell you to you not throw away the food because mm. in our house my mother used to tell us if there was a new meal cooked the next day and you had food left over you start with your leftover if you're eating chips today and you have ugali and uh, mboga in the fridge finish that ugali and mboga before you eat the fish so for us it started very early mm. so these things need to come back i know i know most of us our parents used to tell us when we are younger you know when you're throwing away food you're abusing god because you know it food is sacred yes, yes. food was sacred but i think also with the growing economy right now we are facing some challenges mm -hmm. but with the growing economy as you have more disposable income you want to buy more you know you want to think sometimes more. you don't you don't start eat broccoli and you don't know what broccoli is wow <laughs> <laughs> Yet another important conversation um, that we've had this hour, very necessary for us to talk about this again in the future. Look, we need to come again and we need to open up these conversations a little bit more. Winnie Yegon is a food systems analyst at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Professor Jane Nambuko, professor of horticulture at the University of Nairobi. And Dr. Christopher Mutungi is a senior researcher at the World Resources Institute. Thank you for being here this morning. Let the conversations continue. Asante sana. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day.